Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I am indeed Amit Power, and I'm going to be talking to you about paravertebral blocks. I have a few disclosures here, none of which will impact my ability to deliver this talk. Uh, and I just want to draw your attention to the fact that I will be using QR codes during this presentation. And in fact, if you were to scan this particular QR code, it would take you to where I'm going to host my slides for this talk afterwards. So don't worry about screenshotting or taking pictures, they'll all be available afterwards. So I'm going to start off with a spoiler alert, and that is that I love paravertebrals. That won't come as a surprise to you. But in, in addition to paravertebrals, I also love all blocks. So actually that includes some of the blocks that we are new blocks. And I think I'm going to give you a balanced opinion on what I think about these in the context of the paravertebral block. So I've been asked to kind of talk about paravertebral blocks within the context of new blocks, friend or foe. So what I'm hoping to cover in this short presentation is a bit of my background of paravertebral blocks and a little bit about their history cover what's new with paravertebral blocks and where some of the interesting parts of the evidence are and answer the question whether there is still a role for paravertebral blocks and actually whether new blocks have a role there too. So if I start off with my introduction to paravertebral blocks, well actually during my training I did very few and only did them in the last month of my training. And as a consultant I took on a breast list and I met John McDonald shortly afterwards and John McDonald taught me how to perform paravertebral blocks and the gentleman next to him in this picture is Manoj Karmaka, and he is one of the godfathers of ultrasound guided paravertebral blocks. So with those two people as role models for me, I decided to perform regular paravertebral blocks for breast surgery, and actually the rest is history. Talking about history, let's delve a little bit into the history of paravertebral blocks. This gentleman is Hugo Selheim, and in 1905, he was probably the first person to talk about paravertebral blocks, and he used them for abdominal analgesia. Then Arthur Lorne in 1911 talked about paravertebral conduction anesthesia. And then in 1919, Kappis uh, described the first paravertebral injection that was used for surgical anesthesia for abdominal surgery. Now, paravertebrals were popular in the early 1900s, but in the mid 1900s, they fell out of favour for reasons that are not entirely clear until this anesthesia paper that's published when I was three years old uh, by Eason and Wyatt and uh, just rediscovering paravertebral blocks and using a loss of resistance to air technique. Now then not much changed until ultrasound came along and that's when it gets a bit exciting because in 2000 we described or it was described to measure the depth of the transverse process with ultrasound then put the probe aside and do a loss of resistance to saline technique. In 2009 ultrasound was used to contact the transverse process and then loss of resistance to saline was used to then find it subsequently. Then about a year later, we had an ultrasound guided paravertebral uh, technique described using an out of plane needle. And if you plot a lot of these techniques uh, onto a schematic over here, you've got a number of probe positions and a number of needle insertion points by all of these very clever authors that kind of revolutionize this technique. But how can you summarize this? We can summarize it by talking about having the probe in the transverse or in the paramedian orientation and needling in plane or out of plane. And my preferred technique is to needle in plane. So if I have a look here, this is my transverse in plane needle insertion uh, technique. And this is my paramedian sagittal needle insertion technique. And I kind of just use those two variants. So there are many, many indications of the paravertebral block. And we can split them into acute uh, surgical and non-surgical, probably the biggest region really is using the paravertebral blocks for thoracic surgery, including lung, cardiac and spine, uh, uh, as well as esophageal and probably the area they're most familiar with, uh, which is their use in breast surgery. But they have also been used in general and gynae surgery and uh, in uh, renal stone surgery also for orthopedic and lower limb and the non-surgical use in the acute setting is certainly for rib fractures uh, and for gen more generalized chest trauma. If you look on the chronic side there's a, a, a role of paravertebrals in persistent post-surgical pain and in post-hepatic neuralgia. So lots of use, lots of potential indications. The next slide I'm just going to talk about three areas that are definitely there's consistent papers coming out regularly. The first is in urology. There are more and more papers coming out on the use of paravertebral blocks for uh, percutaneous nephrolithotomy and their reduction in pain and analgesic use. 
Thoracic surgery, paraversal papers are coming out still now in comparison with erector spinae plane block and um, just compared to control or GA. This paper here was looking at the uh, impact that paraversal blocks had on rehabilitation after thoracic surgery. Uh, and there are many, many papers still coming out comparing the newer techniques such as the erector spinae plane block against paraversal. And in most of those situations, paraversal is coming out on top, but it's not necessarily quite as simple as that. The next area I wanted to have a look at is a bit of paraversal anatomy, focusing specifically on the superior costotransverse ligament. Now, traditionally speaking, in this uh, diagram here, but it was created by Anne Barron, a previous fellow of mine, we used to think that the superior costotransverse ligament acted as a formal barrier to the paraversal space. And in order to have an effective paraversal block, you had to stick your needle on the other side of this barrier in order to get local anesthetic in the paraversal space. But we've subsequently seen, for example, with this paper, the MTP paper, now called the Intertransverse Plane Block, published by Iwana Kostash and my Canadian colleagues, we've demonstrated that needle tip position posterior to the superior costotransverse ligament still reliably generates local anesthetic spread into the paraversal space. Now this paper in May 2021, came out earlier on this year, did something clever. They took paraversal spaces and performed micro CTs and they've now really reimagined the way that we think about access to the paraversal space. Now that superior costotransverse ligament isn't a formal barrier. There are two slits either side of it, a medial and a lateral slit, that would allow local anesthetic deposited behind the superior costotransverse ligament to get into the paraversal space. And actually, if you look over here, this is looking from the paraversal space out backwards to the back. You can see here in purple the superior costotransverse ligament with two slits around it where you can have access of local anesthetic deposited behind it actually coming through and getting the ventral ramus. And this is that one of those micro CT slices demonstrating that point there. Now in the past, when people have talked about paraversal blocks, we talked about a whole host of potential benefits, such as a reduction in acute and chronic pain, opioid requirements, nausea and vomiting, and maybe even cancer recurrence. But we've also talked about the ability to perform more ambulatory surgery, perform surgery without general anesthesia, and the fact that you get better patient satisfaction and quality of recovery, etc. I think the items here with a tick by them are fairly established in the literature now and no one would really question that. But where there is something that probably needs a bit more investigation are these areas here, chronic pain, cancer recurrence and patient satisfaction. So we start off by looking at chronic pain. Um, this paper in 2014 upset me greatly because it was the first paper I had seen which showed that actually maybe paraversal blocks weren't so great with chronic pain. And when they looked at these three groups of, of patients having a GA, single shot or continuous paraversal blocks, they actually demonstrated no difference in acute or chronic pain. Both of these groups, they all got morphine, however, and I don't know whether that clouded the situation. But what they did notice was that paraversal blocks were associated with less severe chronic pain and a better health-related quality of life. Now, in 2020, uh, this was a single center center uh, study looking at uh, multiple single-shot paraversals plus GA versus GA alone, looking specifically at chronic pain at six months. And actually, this paper showed a quite significant reduction in chronic pain at six months by almost 50% when paraversal was used, as well as less neuropathic pain. So I thought, there we go, job done. And unfortunately for us, this paper in October 2021 has just been published. It's a prospective, multi-center, randomized, double-blind, parallel group, placebo-controlled trial. And actually, they were looking at just over 350 women having either partial or full mastectomy, and they were randomized to a paraversal block with ripivacaine or with saline. And actually, despite an acute pain benefit with paraversal block, there was no difference in chronic pain at up to a year. So does this mean there's no role of paraversals with chronic pain and would I stop offering it? I definitely wouldn't stop offering it, but I don't think the answer is that clear. It's also important to think about what outcome measures we are measuring when we're looking at blocks. There's a whole host of the traditional ones, but also some other ones that are worthwhile investigating. And actually there are some useful scoring systems that incorporate all of these. So how can we assess the impact of a block? Well, it's important to look at things like 
the minimum clinically important difference. So the smallest change that is important to the patient as opposed to an absolute reduction in opiate or pain medication. And also we can look at quality of recovery scores. I'm talking about scores that are validated like QOR15 or QOR40. So in these two papers from 2011 and 2014, they kind of cemented my exposure to the concept that paravertebral blocks were associated with a higher quality of recovery in breast patients. And also, this was especially the case when used in conjunction with propofol Tiva. Now, this is a recent paper from 2021 looking again at quality of recovery. 68 females having a modified radical mastectomy under general anaesthetic. And they had an ultrasound paravertebral versus a placebo. And when they looked at the post-operative quality of recovery scores, the paravertebral group were associated with a higher quality of recovery score. So that good, positive news. What about cancer and cancer recurrence? Well, we were all waiting for this landmark paper to come out in The Lancet, hoping this was going to show us that paravertebral blocks was a magic bullet when it came to cancer recurrence. They took 2,000 patients having either paravertebral with profile sedation, versus a GA with volatile and opioids. And unfortunately, this study did not show a difference in cancer recurrence between the two groups. It was 10% in both of those groups. But there were some issues with the study. It was 12 years, so a long time when things changed over that period of time. And there was no placebo or sham paravertebral. Every, you know, the block group could also be supplemented with sevifluorin, which is interesting. Both groups got exposed to propyl, fentanyl, and morphine. There was a non-standardized paravertebral technique and actually a failure rate of potentially up to 17%. And although it was multi-center, 59% of the patients came from one particular center in Beijing. So I don't think that paper is necessarily the whole answer. And then one of my current fellows, Nat, pointed me in the direction of this paper from 2021, literally just published looking specifically at invasive ductal carcinoma in the group having breast conserving surgery, so lumpectomies, for example. They took two cohorts of patients and performed propensity score matching, and nearly 1,400 patients in each group of inhalational general anaesthetic with sevifluorine or propofol uh, sedation with a paravertebral block for regional anaesthesia. And they were specifically looking at local recurrence. They didn't specifically look at overall survival. They were looking at local regional recurrence. And actually, they were able to demonstrate via an adjusted hazard ratio of 0.67 that propofol uh, sedation and paravertebral blocks was associated with a reduction in local recurrence. So is that the final answer? I definitely don't think it's the final answer. And we may not get the absolute clear answer here, but certainly there is hope. So I think the jury is out on paravertebral blocks and cancer recurrence, but I'm not going to be too despondent. So if I was to summarise what I thought about the paravertebral block on the side of a pill packet, I would say it's an effective pain relief. Um, it's reliable pain relief. It's pretty safe and it's sort of simple, but it's definitely not something that everyone can perform. And it's certainly not without risk. So I think the issue is that paravertebral blocks aren't an entry-level block. Not all anaesthetists in training will get exposed to it, and not all anaesthetists, even consultants, are happy to perform it. Now, we've got a whole host of new and novel blocks. The question is, can we use the local blocks in the paraspinal region to help us when it comes to learning and performing paravertebral blocks? So if we took a group of general anaesthetists and asked them about blocks and said, OK, how many of you are happy to perform a paravertebral block? we would get a small number of people, I'm sure. But if we said how many of you were happy to maybe not place your, your needle quite as close to the pleura, but maybe to perform a, an MTP or now an intertransverse process block, we may get a few more people. But I'm pretty sure if we said how many of you are prepared to perform an erector spinae plane block, that number would rise. So can we use that? Well, yes, I think we can use that, and I do it in clinical practice. I use that to teach the paravertebral block by skill progression. So start off getting comfortable performing an erector spinae plane block. When you're a bit more confident, take the needle a bit further. And when you're even more confident, take the needle closer to the paravertebral block, which is arguably the more difficult technique. So is a paravertebral block, should it be threatened by new blocks? Are new blocks friend or foe? I still don't think that's a fair question because actually new blocks are part of the regional anesthesia family. And if I was to be fortunate enough to ever be asked to, to give a TED talk on this subject, 
I would say in modern anesthetic practice, new and traditional blocks are not mutually exclusive. There is definitely room for both. So how do I summarize? Paravertebral blocks we know are associated with improved quality of recovery and in opioid reduction, which is very topical and very relevant. So certainly the paravertebral blocks are still a useful skill for anaesthetists. The role in cancer recurrence and chronic pain, however, is currently unclear. Now new blocks can help us when it comes to paravertebral block skill acquisition. They can be used to supplement a paravertebral block, for example, when you combine a paravertebral block with a PEX block. And finally, if there are situations when you can't perform a paravertebral block in because of contraindications, anticoagulation or patient positioning, then certainly new blocks have a role. That's all I have to say on the matter. Thank you very much. I'll leave you with this wonderful image of a transverse in-plane paravertebral block and two QR codes, one to my SlideShare account and one to my YouTube account where you will see this video later. And finally, just a reminder to book your leave for next year for Edinburgh for the combined meeting between RA UK and ISURA. Many thanks.